Thank you, Michel. Uh, thank you, Haile. Thank you, King and Judy, for hosting us here. And it's always so good to be back in Seattle, where I was twice a senior fellow, uh, 30 years ago with King and last year with Tachi, and each time in uh, each time in uh, crucial phases in uh, in my life. I will um, reflect a bit, uh, particularly on how international partnerships in global health are evolving. The spectacular attendance at this uh, conference illustrates the continuing um, expansion of formidable energy um, and the fact that we're also still exploring the boundaries of uh, an evolving field, global health. Um, can I have the next, the first one? I don't know how this... Oh. Okay, thanks. Um, taking a historic perspective, we've gone through uh, several uh, phases uh, in terms of what we call today global health, and which roughly correspond to different phases in geopolitical power relations. And as many of my generation, I started my career in tropical medicine in Antwerp, that's point, uh, point, uh, 1.0, and um, gradually, uh, particularly near the end of the Cold War, uh, we would start talking about international health, health over there, uh, no longer just in the tropics. And, and then global health uh, emerged, a term which didn't even exist uh, or wasn't uh, used uh, two decades ago. And um, many of the institutions present here went through a similar evolution. And Global Health 3.0 really uh, was heavily associated and still is with development aid in terms of the funding. Uh, just think of PEPFAR. Um, and it's not only the nomenclature that uh, changed, but we've also gone through different waves of interest and funding incentives and funding interests. Um, tropical diseases and nutrition were really high in, when it was the time of uh, 1.0. And then in international health, it diversified uh, significantly with tropical diseases, mother and child health, immunization, nutrition, family planning was then quite high on the agenda and disappeared from it afterwards, diarrheal and the respiratory diseases, and health services. And in global health today, uh, the major funding and interest and uh, outputs are really in AIDS, TB, malaria, mother, neonatal, and child health, uh, neglected tropical diseases, which are no longer that neglected, I would say. And then in Europe, a lot of attention for health systems. So this is where we, um, we are, and we are left with a major unfinished agenda. Um, it's not because we have this transition that is necessary, one phase was worse or um, didn't uh, deliver um, than the other. And so, and finish the agenda in terms of burden of disease, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, when it comes to infectious diseases. We have still a major issue on maternal mortality, child health and neonatal mortality, reproductive health and family planning, malnutrition, access to primary health care, and continuing major health disparities, not only between countries and among countries, but also within countries. And much of this will be discussed uh, this week in New York uh, during the um, General Assembly uh, uh, high-level session um, on the Millennium Development uh, Goals. Um, and then there is also, sorry, yeah. But the uh, world is changing. The world is changing. Um, from many perspectives. First of all, the center of the universe is going back to Asia, where it was before the 19th century in terms of economic outputs. And here you, is for those who've been there, the Temple of Heaven in, um, in uh, Beijing, where you can actually stand on the center of the world. Um, and we are going through a uh, formidable change. And the world has always been in transition but it's going much faster than ever before. Um, we have now that very soon the three of the top economies will, uh, three of the four top economies will be in Asia. It's already two of three. Um, competition for energy, land, water, commodities will increase and may lead to, um, to instability. Um, 
the continuing demographic growth will be in a two decades with an over 9 billion people, but there's also a demographic shift in terms of aging. There's a pandemic of non-communicable diseases looming. R&D and higher education landscape are evolving, and overall uh, there is growing interdependence. So all this is a, and it, they're very strong arguments for um, expanding the concept of global health, which is basically built on uh, interdisciplinary action and um, dealing with health disparities. And then there is climate change. Um, so while we are uh, still uh, trying to define what global health is, um, that we are uh, expanding, exploring the boundaries, um, there is actually already a new paradigm emerging, while 3.0 is still in, in formation. And a few reflections here. One, um, ironically, global health has been up to recently mostly a North American issue. In Europe we have the tradition of tropical medicine, international health, and when you uh, Google global health, uh, these are the countries that uh, show up. The only country that is of uh, a middle income country is Peru, um, where the uh, Universidad Peruana um, Cayetana Heredia is um, having a global health program. Um, and there are others, uh, there are 13 associated members or partner members of the uh, consortium here uh, that are based in lower middle income countries. Um, and some argue to say that, um, you know, that global health is uh, business as usual for institutions in low and middle income countries. But I would argue that global health is not a geographic concept in contrast to tropical medicine, but it's a field of inquiry which prof is profoundly multidisciplinary and addressing health disparities everywhere. So it is relevant also for institutions in the uh, so-called developing world. And I'll give you now two slides with where I think that we uh, are going to see or should see a transition from 3.0 to 4.0. And um, today, as I mentioned, and as I showed, uh, most global health centers and institutions are in high income countries, but they will become worldwide, I think, very soon. We should see in a, um, a world where the PIs are not only from North America and Europe, but with great diversity. We still talk today about our study site somewhere, but these should be centers of excellence and a network of centers of excellence based also on the same um, quality uh, criteria as anywhere else. 3.0 is already more multidisciplinary than uh, international health or tropical medicine has been, but is moving more and more into truly multidisciplinary approach. The nearly exclusive attention for infectious diseases does not correspond to where morbidity and mortality is in many, many countries. So we have to go through um, working on broader health issues and disparities. Current practice of uh, academic uh, global health is in clinical trials, epidemiology, and implementation, although you can wonder whether that's the role of universities. And we have to go through a full spectrum of translation from discovery, basic science, uh, to implementation science, the science of delivery. And there's still a lot of work to be done. And another set of issues is also about how we work. Today, global health is focusing on the individual and its end population, and I think one of the positive developments is that it has broken through the barriers of the antagonism uh, between public health and, uh, and medicine. But we need to add also the environment. Think of climate change. Another issue is about education. Global health education is fairly the monopoly today of uh, high-income countries. Students come here go back. Uh, what we need is a global network of customized higher education on uh, global health. And I think there, there are some um, emerging uh, examples here. Training has focused on individuals and capacity building on individuals, but what we need above all is institutional capacity building, including on management and applying uh, grants and, and managing them. 
And finally, um, uh, was it last year or was it this year that Victor Zhao and uh, others and Mike Merson from Duke University published a paper in the Lancet on from academic health uh, sciences uh, centers to systems and where global health is an integral part of the health agenda of a university, not just the international activities of a, that particular university. Now, there is already a transition from 3.0 to 4.0, and there are, as I mentioned, 13 um, partner uh, members of the consortium, and there are others that are um, emerging. We'll hear some of the examples of, uh, from African universities, for example. But basically, it means far more doing it together than doing it for somebody else. Um, in Europe, we are seeing a, uh, quite a change in um, funding um, opportunities and conditionalities. And uh, for example, we have the European Developing Country um, Partnership for Clinical Trials, EDCTP, and uh, the Wellcome Trust, MRC, CEDA, and DFID, which are probably the major funders for global health activities and of global health research. And they're all insisting on um, this kind of spirit of partnerships and PIs in developing countries. Um, one major example, and we'll hear about it from uh, in a session tomorrow or on Tuesday, is the DFID um, Welcome Trust and IDRC, um, you know, network uh, initiative on networks. And one spin-off, for example, is already a diploma course that the University of Washington, Johns Hopkins, and the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine are doing uh, with, together with Macquarie University and the Christian Medical College in uh, Kilimanjaro. Now, before ending, just two reflections. One is on uh, what does global globalization means for higher education. And this in a context of skyrocketing cost of higher education in, in this country and also in my country, in the UK. Um, and the fundamental question, I believe, is that are we American or European institutions with a global mission, or are we global institutions based in North America and in Europe and part of a whole global system? This is really a strategic moment. Uh, a strategic moment uh, in the sense because we are still in this formative phase of global health from a historic perspective, but also because of the changes in the world. Higher education is still an expanding market, and the questions are should we centralize it, overseas courses, delocalization, joint programs, several universities are establishing universities or medical schools elsewhere. Um, these are important questions. Um, but above all, I believe that supporting centers of excellence is going to be an incredibly important um, uh, activity. And my final slide here is that all this will add to our challenges. Um, we all have challenges in terms of the, the challenge of the day, but um, we will have to reflect very seriously on who's in control and who sets the agenda. Who gets the revenue from research and education? It can't only be in the um, institutions here in North America or in Europe. Multidisciplinary work and realities uh, is, is challenging the realities of um, funding, which is usually reviewed by people from one discipline and, and uh, from um, monodisciplinary funding streams. We have um, implications for academic credit and careers when it comes to who is the first author and the last author um, when in our partnerships. And how can we strengthen capacity in high-income countries in the current global health institutions while supporting capacity building overseas? Is this a zero-sum game? I think we need special capacity funding streams. So to conclude, um, first of all, Academic global health, let's never forget it, is part of a wider uh, landscape, uh, a wider ecosystem from business to foundations, etc. We all know it. And uh, so we should make sure that we are in sync with how the world evolves there. And because of this transitioning world, um, and while we are um, trying to improve the quality of our science and our education, we must also resolutely engage in the debate of where we should go. Uh, 
and uh, taking a long-term view so that the decisions we take today are moving into what I call Global Health 4.0. Thank you very much.